Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. We're so glad you have dropped in here. Hi, Lane. Hi, hello everyone. So today on Seed Talk, we have a special guest, but I'll get to that in just a second. So friends, we are just so glad you've decided to drop in here. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're returning, we appreciate you coming back for more. If you want to learn more about the work that the Gardener's Workshop is doing, you can find out over at thegardenersworkshop.com who brings this podcast and the sister podcast, Field and Garden, to you. And we just love doing it. So for you, maybe you are a newbie. You're just kind of joining us here. So I am the grower, farmer, head bottle washer here at the Gardener's Workshop. And Lane is our seed manager. And she is the one that birthed this child of Seed Talk based on all of the questions that she gets from our customers. And so it's just really been very popular and we're really grateful that Lane is um, doing all that. So today we have a special guest and we're just so happy um, to introduce who has become a really, really good friend, my friend, Emily Neckel um, in from North Carolina of Fugles Flowers. And I'm gonna let, she's gonna introduce herself and tell us, but I'm just thrilled to death that she's here today with us. Um, So take it away, Lane. All right, yes, welcome everyone. We are so excited to have Emily here today. And we are gonna talk all about her experience this past year in growing celosia for seed production. So of course, we're going to go into all the details about how to save celosia seeds. But even if you're not interested in saving seeds, I really hope you'll listen in. And I hope this podcast encourages you guys to appreciate all the time and energy and effort that goes into getting those seeds in your seed packets there in the first place, because there is a lot that goes into it as we're going to learn today. So Shall we get started, everyone? Yes. Okay, so the first question, Emily, I want you to introduce yourself. So can you tell us how you got into flower farming and then also where you're located and how much land you farm on? So um, I live in Northeastern North Carolina in a very rural community, and we um, are on a seven acre farm out just sort of in the middle of nowhere. and. I got into flower farming in 2014 when I started trying to do succession planting of sunflowers. I only did three that summer, which was a huge deal for me. And what I found was that I just loved working with the flowers and I loved working with the ground. And so that just sort of began this wonderful business that was uh, introduced in 2015, Fuggles Flowers. And for Gosh, for seven years, we just, we worked the soil, we built the soil, we learned how to succession plant, we became just really avid, avid flower farmers, and we were able to bring so many wonderful flowers to our community and to the surrounding area, and we've done it all really, you know, with Lisa's help and learning from her, and we've just had such a great time doing it. So we farm on about two acres. We don't use all two acres in production all the time. We've really, really focused on building our soil. And it took us a good six years to be able to build all the way up to two acres of farmable land. At one point in time, we're usually in production of about half an acre, maybe three quarters of an acre, but we have tons of great space. We actually, we live uh, right up against a swamp. So we do have some moisture issues on our farm, but our our ground is, it's our soil is excellent. And and we really have found over the years by using really good techniques with with cover cropping and really just thinking about taking care of the environment out there. And we've really found over the years that our flowers are just bigger and brighter and happier and just everything just does so much better. So great. Okay, so that was about flower farming. So my next question is, have you grown flowers on a large scale for seed production before? And if not, what led you down this path? And I know Lisa was involved in this too. So feel free to jump in as well, Lisa. Okay. Okay. So no, I have never grown seed, large scale seed production for the two years before this summer, I actually had been working with this um, this plant, the Texas plume that we're talking about, and had done some very small scale seed production. But we're talking about 
25 feet with maybe 200 plants and we really weren't tagging them we weren't watching them as as closely as we did this past summer things in my life just changed a little bit last winter and my time commitment for my farm had to change and lisa came down in february i remember with her dog tucker who is just awesome and so well behaved. Um, and she said to me, would you be interested in trying to vamp up this seed? Because I know you've been working with it a couple of years. I had been telling her I just loved the flowers. I loved the colors. I loved the, the vigorousness of it. It's just such a strong and wonderful plant to work with. And it's actually very easy to work with. So no, this was my first adventure into seed production. And when she left that February afternoon, I, she said, what do you think you can produce? And I said, oh, I don't know. Maybe I can produce a kilo or so. I don't know, maybe a couple of pounds. And we were able to produce, produce so much more. And I think it's really because we had a huge patch out there and these plants, they just, they pumped it out for us. They were just so kind to us and gave us some really, really, really wonderful product. I um, knew that Emily had to kind of change her business model because of her time constraint. And I was, I was actually, I didn't think about that, her growing seed until I had already contacted her and said, hey, I wanted to come down for a visit that got me to thinking that my goodness, I know how much she loved farming and how good she had gotten. I mean, she was literally at the coming up on the top of her game of becoming like a commercial farmer, just having her systems in order, just pumping out the flowers and knowing what she needed to do to have the flowers and scheduling them. And I mean, a lot of the problems that a lot of farmers face I mean, Emily had mastered it and then she had to kind of like pull out the stops and stop. And I thought, you know, we really want to produce um, the Texas plumes, which is a strand of Celosia that was um, selected um, by Frank Arnowski years and years ago, probably I think it was in 2000 and I looked up the date, actually. I think I bought the seed in 2014 and I started growing it each year on my farm and saving seed. Um, and so we had kind of created this home base um, collection of seeds of just these amazing plumes. Y'all, I mean, anybody that's, you know, followed me for more than a nanosecond knows that I totally love celosias. They're a huge part of our commercial farm for bouquets and commercial customers. Um, and we just loved them. And there just was no other plume because I grow them all. There was no other plume that rivaled this Texas plume strand in height. I mean, they are so tall. But it, anyway, so I thought, you know what? Maybe Emily would be willing to grow this seed out for us since she's not going to be growing a bunch of other stuff. It'll let her keep her hands in the dirt and it will help us out at the same time. And I was thrilled when she accepted the challenge. Yes, we're very excited. All right, Lisa. So what is the history behind Texas plumes and why are they so special? Why is this the seed that you asked Emily to produce? So it's a strand of Celosia that is not really commercially available. Um, I mean, it's not like you can go to catalogs and find this in there. And um, it began decades ago. Um, Frank Arnowski began it, started doing some selecting um, and saving seed. I mean, he's done amazing work with that. And then I purchased some of that seed at a ASCFG, that's the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, has a research fund to help fund the research for cut flower production. And people give some really great stuff. And then we pay some pretty ridiculous prices for the stuff in our effort to raise funds. Well, the his some of his celosia became available there. And I went in with some other growers and um, purchased a small portion. I think it was less than 50 seeds is actually what I started with. And um, I mean, I grew them. Oh, my goodness. And just as I mentioned, the the fullness of the plumes the color selection of the plumes. And then if you add on top of that, that it is, my, in my experience, the height is over 36 
to 45 to 48 inches easily um, when we grow them. And so there's no question that it is an amazing cut flower. Um, and you can see if you're watching this on YouTube, I invite you to go over there and look at it. She's showing some beautiful images. Um, the ones on the right with our logo are some of the ones that when I went down to visit Emily after they started to bloom, we harvested some and took images. Um, and it's just it's just really, really special. And it's special because it's just not widely available yet. So it was special to us to be able to produce it and make it available for others. That is special. All right. So now I want to talk about the actual growing of these plants. So Emily, did you start the seeds indoors or did you sow directly outdoors? And how much seed did you actually end up starting? And what seed starting method did you use? Okay, so we started all of the seed indoors. What I ended up doing was I sowed an open flat and just sprinkled it, literally just took a handful and just sprinkled it on. And then a week later, we transferred over about 5,500 um, plants into 128 cell flats. It took a long time to do this, but it was the only way to ensure that we were going to have the large number of plants that we really needed in this uh, gene bank. So this was all done in, we started in April and the plants were then grown uh, inside for about three weeks and then brought outside to harden off. And they were put into the ground sort of early, mid June. And we had five 100 foot beds with 5,000 plants in it. Uh, so we had a pretty large genetic pool. We had a, a good number of plants to be able to really start looking at the different characteristics that's found in this particular um, subset of plants. Then let's see, then so we're in June. Um, they're just growing, doing their thing. They've um, they've attached really well, really hanging out. And about a month later, we ended up, it took them a little bit of time. We pinched them really well at the beginning of July, and then we trellised them. So one of the reasons that we trellis them is because we wanted to make sure that the plants would never fall over in a windstorm. We didn't have any, any issues like that. And the plants did great. They, uh, they started flowering um, in, let's see, it was late July and we started harvesting seeds off of them right at the beginning of September. So from July until frost, which is October, they flowered all the way through. So, in this subset of plants, we really had, you know, if you're growing 200 plants, maybe 25 feet or 100 feet, it's very different than growing a large patch of 5,000 plants. So once they started flowering, then we were able to start culling them. And what that means is you go in and you look for traits that you're interested in and traits that you're not interested in. And interestingly, we're, there was there were about 24 or 25 celosia, uh, uh, Lisa, you might find this interesting, that were really short. They were like, six inches tall, they would be great bedding plants, but we took those sorts of characteristics out of the bed. There were other other ones in there that weren't plume-like, they were more spiky or more crested, and we took a lot of those particular plants out because what we were really looking for from July on was to make sure that we had those really nice, really long, I mean, we're, look, we're talking about six to eight inch long plumes, tight plumes, that are beautiful, vibrant colors. And that's that was the, the particular gene bank that we were interested in keeping. And so we let these plants flower for quite a while. And like I said, I started harvesting them in September. All right, so you just touched on this. You said you ended up ultimately with around 5,500 plants. So my question mm -hmm. is how much land were they grown on and how far apart did you end up spacing the plants? And just for everyone listening that might be interested in seed saving, when you're growing for seed, it can be a good idea to space plants a little further apart to provide for good air circulation and help keep diseases at bay. So did you find that you needed to make any adjustments compared to your typical celosia spacing when growing for cut flowers? Or was that same spacing actually sufficient? Okay, so for the plants that we ended up with, we did one garden with five beds, a hundred foot long with a thousand in each one. That was five, that was 5,000. And then elsewhere on the farm, we put the other, um, the other 500 because it didn't fit in that space. So they were grown in a very small amount of space. They were a hundred foot long and our bed tops are 30 inches wide. And so in the, on that 30 inch wide bed top on one bed, you, you plant them four across with six inches apart. 
And that actually is what we were growing a lot of our yeah. celosias that we pinch for cut flowers. But this particular spacing gave us really good air circulation for the seed production. So I would ac actually recommend for cut flower gardeners, for regular home gardeners, you can space them pretty close together, but you, they do need a little bit of space to be able to sort of separate out. Perfect. That's good to know. All right. So now let's talk about pollination. So in our episode number 11, we actually talked about seed storage and saving. And in that episode, we talked about the difference between open pollinated plants and hybrids. So you can go back and listen to that if you want to know more about that. But one of the things we pointed out is that seed saved from open pollinated plants will come back true to type as long as the flowers are not cross pollinated, either intentionally or inadvertently by another variety. So if you're really intent on producing a seed that will produce plants like the parents, you may need to isolate those plants in some way from other varieties. And if you're isolating by distance, the isolation distance required is largely influenced by the way those flowers are actually pollinated, whether they're typically self-pollinating or pollinated by insects or wind. So plants that are mainly self-pollinating might require very short isolation distances, whereas plants that are primarily pollinated by wind may require very long distances. So can you talk to us about how Celosia plumosa is actually pollinated and what measures you had to take to prevent cross-pollination with other varieties? Yes, of course. The first thing that I decided to do was to not grow any other celosia of any sort whatsoever on my farm. This was going to ensure that we didn't have cross-pollination between plumosa, spicata, what have you. In addition, I did some research and celosia is part of the amaranthaceae. Um, and I did some just sort of snooping around to see if there were any other people in my area that grew amaranth or celosias. And they're really, most people around here are growing zinnias and things of that nature. And so what we ended up doing is putting this large patch of 5,000 plants out in the back of our field, which is close to the woods and, and also a horse farm. And so there were other measures that were helping to ensure that there wasn't cross-pollination amongst perhaps somebody was growing, you know, a, a celosia in their front yard and that we were trying to ensure that that didn't happen. So we did find celosia is um, wind pollinated primarily. It does have self-pollination um, capabilities. It is somewhat pollinated by insects, it, it, but wind does it the best job. And we were, were very lucky. We have good wind here. We had great air circulation. Our plants were really clean. That's very important when you're doing seed saving is to ensure that your beds and your plants are very clean and don't have anything that there is going to impede the movement of the pollen. We also, like I said earlier, we called out structures and characteristics that we weren't at, that we weren't interested in before the flowers opened. So the way that celosia works is that it the flowers actually open from the bottom and then they start stacking on the top as the stem elongates to hold the seeds. And so you do have a little bit of time to get rid of things that you don't want, or if there are characteristics that you're really interested in, you can actually take organza bags and you can bag the flowers and close the bottoms really well. So what happens in that situation is the wind helps self-pollination. And the only thing that can happen in that organza bag is pollen from that plant hits the female structures of a, another particular flower. The pollen from one flower goes to the, the female of the, um, the other flower to produce the seed. So you're getting a, um, you're getting a plant that's going to be more true to type of that particular characteristic. And what we found, what I decided to do this year, because it was really the first year that I had been in the presence of so many of this particular seed line. And so there were characteristics that I had in the last couple of years of growing this, I had never seen before. And so I let, I decided to keep the plumes just out in the open to, to cross pollinate one another, to, you know, wind pollinate, but we did isolate one particular characteristic and we've kept that seed. And we're gonna use that next year as a, a trial for subsequent years in which we are hoping, because there are we, six or seven just really vibrant, gorgeous, gorgeous colors. This is a really sort of hot 
set of colors that just does nothing but make you happy. So we're really hoping in the future that we'll be able to work on doing some isolation and, and separating out all of those colors. But this was kind of a, you know, we were we were asked to do this huge thing that we had no idea what to do, really. And we just kind of tried to figure out step by step and not take not take it too far too quickly and, and get ourselves confused. So <laughs> great. All right, so now let's talk about harvesting. So when you're collecting seeds, it's really important to harvest at the right stage when those seeds are fully mature and ripe. You want the embryos inside those seeds to be fully developed so those seeds have maximum viability. But you also don't want to harvest too late and then risk something happening to those seeds. So my first question is, how did you know when the seeds were ready to be harvested and then my next question is, as a flower farmer, I'm curious, how did it feel to have all these aging flowers in your fields? And for anyone watching over on YouTube, I'm going to put a couple of pictures up from Emily showing the harvest stage for seed collection while she's describing it to us. Okay, Lane, I'm actually going to answer your second question first. As yes, a flower farmer, how did I feel about the aging flowers? This was the first proper effort of seed saving and i have been cutting flowers at the the stage of of just enjoying the flowers for so many years that it was weird it was it was very <laughs> uncomfortable yeah. actually so yeah. during the time that it's yeah very uncomfortable because we would go out there so so in celosia the when you you know when to harvest it when the neck is strong you can take the the bottom of the flower and sort of push the neck back and forth and the flower doesn't really wiggle and so for weeks I did that and I would say, why are you doing that? You don't need to harvest any of this stuff. So it was strange, but I will admit that I did take a couple of cups of coffee back there and a couple of <laughs> cups of tea in the afternoon. And I may have sat in the middle of the field a couple of times and did a little meditation here and there. And it was, it was such a special thing to be able to be around, you know, I mean, literally tens of thousands of these flowers. It was just really special. And so once I got over that, this was really cool and beautiful and what have you. And then we really had to start getting to work because in the past with our seed saving, we had done a little bit, but we had never done this on a large scale effort. And so when we started saving the seed, we, you really have to make sure that you have at least three days of very dry weather. You need to you don't want a lot of moisture in the air. It's very important when you harvest seed heads that you do it in the afternoon on a sunny day. It can be a cloudy day, but it just you need to make sure that, that the heads are going to be in the driest position that they can possibly be because moisture actually is a seed farmer's enemy because you don't want to get moisture in there because you don't want anything to happen to your seed. So what of we course. found to begin with is that we started harvesting the seeds when the celosia heads had about a third of the color on the top. If you look at the picture on the left hand side, you can actually see the reproductive structures inside of the flowers. You can see the little whorl of the anthers. So you can see with that how small those structures are and how many of them are on each one of those. The, I don't know what the botanical name is, but the structure in which the seeds are being produced. So when we started harvesting the seed in um, in September, I was gifted by the weather six solid weeks of dry, which is almost unheard of. And that was really helpful in my first year because when you're starting to save seed, as Lane said, you really want to wait until you have as much mature seed on your plant because you don't want the immature stuff. You want to make sure as much of it is mature and it's going to be able to be used for later on. And over the six week period, we did find that we were able to harvest much later. So if you look at the difference between the two images, the second image on the right, you see there's very, very little color at the top. That is the best time to save a celosia seed. And I will tell you, this hurts a little bit. When you, when you harvest the seed, what we did is we just took a five gallon buckets and clean snips. We always cleaned our snips. Uh, and we would just top the flower at the, the top of the stem. We just kept the stems on the plant. We weren't looking to cut anything extra, put the seed head into the bucket. But if you've done it right, you have to gift the earth a little bit of the seed as it falls into the bucket 
because your seeds on the bottom are so mature that just touching that head causes some of it to fall. So it kind of became a little bit of a joke in the in the field when we were harvesting, you know, a little for you, a little for me, a little for you, a little for me. <laughs> so, um, but it is, <laughs> you know, you, the earth needs some of it too. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and as just as long as you, you, harvest into we harvested into these buckets um and we were able to put i don't know maybe 100 150 heads into each bucket and we cut as many of these plume flowers that we could find that were tight and so let's just go back one second one of the characteristics that we were really interested in so in celosia there's got to be some genetic variation in which the flowers are actually either set really close together um, on the head or they're actually separated by small fragments of stem so we really as we went through this six week period we really were able to even more isolate the characteristics that we were really interested in because we really want to keep those really nice tight heads for your flower farmers and gardeners and just because they're so 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 beautiful and they're so strong i just can't i can't say enough about how strong and how easy this plant really is to work with so now let's talk about the details of harvesting and collecting the seed you've already touched on it a little but let's talk about how you actually harvested, collected the seed, and then after that, how did you actually process, clean, and dry the seed? And I told Emily when we were speaking before, whatever she did, she did such an excellent job because that seed is so clean. I was beyond yeah. impressed. So whatever you did, it worked. Well, it worked. That's awesome. You have no <laughs> idea that made me so happy yesterday. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So once you start collecting the seed off of the heads into the buckets, then what we did is we have um, these black crates that a lot of flower farmers use for um, bulb growing. And we've been able to collect a number of these over the years. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and we, I had some brown craft paper because I wanted to dry them on something. And so we literally just every bucket that we we produced, we dumped it into a a black crate with this brown craft paper on the bottom. And the way that we dried them is I brought them over to my mom's garage next door and I put a large piece of plastic on the floor. And then I put the black crates on the floor just next to each other. And we had four separate fans drying them. And every single day I went over and I turned them by hand or with tongs, just depending on how far away they were for me to be able to get to them. And the the way that we determined that they were dry it took about seven to ten days for for them to be able to dry to a point where when i touched them it was crackly and crispy and if i sort of sort of plumed it around it, it there was you just it it felt dry you could feel the difference between the start and the finish and i i want to just go back really quickly back to the harvesting of the seeds when you harvest the seeds at the correct time on the head, the, the head actually feels drier. It feels less heavy. Mm -hmm. And so you can use a heaviness indicator after doing it for a bit of time to see how dry your plants are anyway. Um, so after seven to 10 days um, of turning them every day, you have to turn them every day or you're going to end up having mold problems. And this was a time that we were starting to get a little bit of rain. We have a lot of moisture here in Northeastern North Carolina. And so it was really important to keep, you've got to keep that air circulation. Once I figured out they were dry, I started the process of filtering or of sifting. And so we used five, five Ooh. different levels of sifting. Yes. Oh, wow. And it was really important. I, I scoured websites. I scoured my mom's kitchen. Actually, I ended up using for one of the most important parts, which separated such an um, enormous amount of the chaff from the seed was actually um, a, uh, a strainer I've had since I can, I mean, since we were living in New Hampshire when I was 10 years old, like, isn't that funny? Just, just, <laughs> wow. you have things in your home that you can do some of this stuff where you don't have to go buy expensive equipment at all. So anyway, so we, we cleaned it with five separate layers and then it was time to winnow it. And so winnowing is an art. It really is an art. And I didn't really understand that until I actually thought about it and dreamed about it and worried about it and then did it. So winnowing is 
just the, the, the art of using um, air movement to separate your mature seed from everything else that's left over, the immature seed that didn't, um, didn't form properly, any extra plant material, what have you. There's a lot of videos out on the internet about winnowing. A lot of them are very intimidating. It's, it doesn't need to be intimidating. We set up this most simple winnow. We've, we used one of our four fans that actually had the lowest setting of wind movement. We put it um, up on a, a coffee table. We had three buckets in front of it, one to collect the seed, the, the mature seed, one to collect the immature seed, and then the rest was just, um, just debris, plant debris and dust. And what we found when we winnowed it, we did it very slowly and we were very nervous when we were doing it. My team, by the way, I have this amazing team of Liz and Jody, and I just want to just big shout out to these ladies who just are amazing and thank you so much for everything you do. Anyway, so we're all kind of freaking out a little bit because we don't nearly know what we're doing. And as we do the winnow, what we realize is that it works. Like it just mm. works. The, the mature seed is falling in the first bin. The, the, the immature seed, which I kept actually, and we're going to spread out on part of our fields next year because we've decided we want to turn our whole entire farm into celosia, just random celosia everywhere. And then all the chafe came out. And so that's, you know, we ended up with really clean seed that I was, we we're really proud of, just really, really proud of. Oh yeah. You should be proud. It was so clean. Wasn't it Lisa? Yes, it was. <laughs> And I agree with, um, it's a little intimidating at the different methods that people have um, for showing, like, it's like, they're like, and this is, you have to do exactly this way and like this. And I was just going to say, it must have seemed magical when you actually tried it and you realized it's working. (laughs) You know, that first one that we did, and I was, I mean, I was literally shaking. I was so nervous because here you've spent all these months and you have this box and it's this tiny little thing. And it's so valuable to you because it's all your time. It's all your effort. And once we realized it was working, everybody relaxed. Everybody had a good time. We, we listened to Gregorian chanting while we were, I don't know. It was so random. It was just (laughs) such a wonderful morning. That was one of the best mornings we had all year actually as a team. So um, really the winnowing part was if you're going to save seed and you're going to try winnowing, don't be scared. Just try it. It's not a big deal. If people make it out to be much more of a deal than it really is. Great advice. All right. So now let's talk about germination testing, because that is an important part of the process. You want to make sure that the seed that you saved is actually viable and vigorous. So how did you actually perform your germination testing? Okay. Germination testing, as you said, it's absolutely necessary to determine the quality of your seed. So we actually decided to do it two different ways. The first way that we did it was using the soil blocking technique. I love soil blocking. If you haven't tried it, it's something to to really look into because it's just wonderful. So we we did four flats, 120 um, cell flats of the celosia and had good results. I'll tell you the results in just a minute. And so for the second type of testing, we did it on paper towels. And for paper towel testing, we wet the paper towels. We sprinkled the seed on the wet paper towels. We we put the paper towel then over the top of the seed, put it into a Ziploc bag, put it on um, a cafeteria tray that was on a heat mat. So it was still getting heat, but it wasn't directly on the heat mat. So I opened the Ziploc bag after two days and then reclosed it and just turned it over. And on day four, we counted. So for both the soil blocking and the paper towel germination rate, the soil blocking gave us 82% and the the paper towel gave us 84%. And we had a a number of of replications to ensure that really those were the numbers that we were getting. But the plants look great. You know, I I brought some to Lisa, so she was able to see them. Um, So we're really pleased with the ability to clean the seed as well as we did on our first try. Oh yes, it was very impressive. All right, so now I want to give people the idea of the scale we're talking about here. So how much seed did your plants ultimately produce in terms of pounds per thousand plants? Sure. We produced about two to two and a half pounds per thousand plants of clean wow. seed. That's, That's a amazing. lot. That's a that lot. That's so awesome. Yeah. Were you surprised by the amount of seed or were you anticipating I- it? 
I, I was not anticipating it. I, I remember telling Lisa that I was going to grow a couple of pounds because, you know, I had literally no idea what to expect. And even when we were harvesting and drying and sifting, and, you know, I was going through all the different layers of sifting, I still had no concept of how many seeds I was really producing until at the very end, we were able to do, you know, our, our um, weighing, but you know, I, I do believe that these plants have the ability to produce enormous amounts of seeds. Even the home gardener could use these plants and save some seeds for next year and, and have really yeah. great success. All right. So <laughs> having spent so much time with the Texas plumes this past year, I'm curious what the most noteworthy characteristics that you picked up on that you observed both as a plant, maybe in the landscape, maybe for a home gardener, and also as a cut flower. Okay. So I've been talking the whole time about these lovely tight plumes, which are perfect for cut flowers, just perfect. And so as a home gardener or a cut flower farmer, you can cut these at the right stage and have gorgeous cut flowers. But what I also found was because I was not cutting them as cut flowers, I wasn't taking the whole stems. And every time I cut them, they just produced more flowers for me. I would say that each plant probably produced six or seven consecutive amounts of like a flower and then it would keep making another flower and then another and it just kept going and going and going and what i found was because we actually put a bunch of these plants in our landscape and in some of our beds is that if you allow it to these plants will get six seven eight feet tall we had some that were over wow. 10 feet tall at the end of it all so and they also flowered from for me from july until frost which was um, early november wow. And they were beautiful the entire time. They were strong. They were vigorous. They were noteworthy. They, you know, they make you, these are the kinds of flowers that make you stop in your tracks and you're like, oh my goodness, that's so beautiful. I'm so glad that I have that around. And I really hope that, you know, that cut flower farmers, but also that home gardeners try this particular plant, because I do believe that everybody's going to be very, very pleased with what they're going to get. They're going to really enjoy it. They have the opportunity to save their own seeds. They have the opportunity to see all the wonderful things that this plant can give to you and to give to your environment. Yeah. And they're beautiful by themselves in a vase. And then also Emily provided the picture on the right, showing how pretty they look mixed with other flowers. Lisa, did you have something to say? I was just going to say, Celosias fit everything landscape, cut flower gardens, um, and they're also just really attract bees and pollinators, um, and they're just an all-around great flower, and I'm just so glad that we um, are going to be able to offer this and that Emily was able to grow it for us. Yes. All right, so I'm curious which colors were your favorites, because there are some beautiful colors in there. And would you be interested in the future in selecting for colors? And can you just describe generally how that color selection process would work? Sure. The colors in this mix are just hot. They're awesome. They are flaming, bright, happy. There are six or seven, depending on how you look at it, different colors in there. They include a shrimp. They include, um, the shrimp I think also has a little orange in it. So there, then there might be a, a separate orange that we're going to look for really more closely next year. There's a yellow one. There's a buttercreamy sort of, um, there's cotton candy like one. There's a magenta one and there's a salmon one. Oh, and pretty. I can't pick my favorite one. I, I think they're all super, super, super beautiful. And I am really, we, Lisa and I have already talked about this. I'm really interested in working on separating these colors out. And that's the future of this project is to take next year to really start focusing on selecting the best buttercream, selecting the best salmon, selecting the best shrimp so that we can offer individual flowers in the future. I think it's a really exciting project and I'm just super excited to be part of it. So, yeah. And so, and cause I, I know it'll be questions. planted in people's minds now. Oh my goodness. When will those colors be available? So this type of project Beautiful. takes years. So is that they'll be the first ones to learn about that um, from us as soon as that happens, because Emily 
um, will be doing all that process we just talked about for a couple of years to isolate colors, at least, at least. Um, so, and that's the whole plant breeding thing. Um, so. And how would that work if you decided you wanted to isolate, if there's a really pretty buttercream flower, how would you go about isolating that color and trying to select for that? So we go back to these organza bags that I was talking about. I use six to nine inch bags this year. I'm going to have to get bigger ones because the flowers are, they get crushed in there. Some of them do because they're so big. But what we're, what we're planning on doing is bagging out our favorite of every color, a certain number of every color, and then separating it that way. And then in the subsequent years, learning how to build isolation tents, learning how to remove part. You, there's so much in this project that it's a little dizzying because I'm really super new to it, but it's also really exciting to be able to, you know, st stretch my legs and make myself yeah. think out of the box and go back to my botany class from college and go back to learning about plant genetics. And there are so many possibilities in this particular subset of plants that can be done. And I'm just really excited about the future. And that leads right into my next question. So did you enjoy growing for seed production purposes? And what was your favorite part of the whole process? And also, what did you learn along the way? You know, this was a very strange summer for me in a lot of ways. And being having said that I was going to do that. I'm a, a very serious person. I take everything as far as I need to, to make sure that I do it properly. And I was very nervous because I really wasn't sure exactly how I was dealing with this. But what I found was that I was able, when you're a flower farmer, you're cutting flowers every twice a week, you're, you're super busy, you're doing all sorts of things. And I was able this year, I was very lucky this year to be able to step back and just focus really on this project. And so these plants got a lot of my time, which was wonderful. I, I loved this patch. I loved being around these plants. I loved just having the opportunity to be in, in again, just tens of thousands of flowers. I will yeah. say that September afternoons from one to four every day in the really hot heat here was hard. And when you're doing seed production, your time is different. It's very concentrated when you're harvesting, when you're drying, when you're, and you have to be like, it doesn't matter if you don't want to go and do it. You got to go out there and you got to harvest those seven crates of seeds. Like it doesn't, that's just what you have to do. The plants don't wait for you. So yes. I found that a little challenging because, well, because, you know, I have a family and kids and struggling and what have you. But what I found when I was finished with the project, once we had cleaned the seed, gotten through the whole project, I loved it. I just loved it. It was such an interesting project. And this idea that a little part of my team gets to be part of a little part of all these other people's teams all over the place. And it's just so exciting to me that we were able to do this and do it well and be successful at it because we're able to bring something really neat to a lot of people. So I definitely want to stay on it and learn as much as I can and, and, you know, hopefully get into seed saving of some other really valuable crops that are, are not amaranth because we can't grow any more amaranth other than this particular plant on my farm <laughs> ever again. Yes. <laughs> yes. So at this point in time, and this could change five seconds from now, but does it excite you more to think of growing a field for cut flower production or a field for seed production? Oh, that's a, that's a really hard question. You know what? Seed production. Ooh. I think that the impact that I feel that can be brought to the world is so amazing. And I really love that we are taking something that, that we as a group see as valuable and usable and finding a way to get it to other people so that they can enjoy it. Because when it comes down to it, flowers are just, they're lovely. They're, they're just wonderful to have around. They're important for the earth. They're important for biodiversity, but they just make you happy and they make you stop 
And we all need to take a second and stop and flowers help you do that. And I'm just delighted that we can offer this to everybody. And we're so excited to know the person behind these seeds, because it's really rare when you get a pack of seeds to actually know the person and the story behind the seeds in that pack. So it's so exciting that you're talking to us and that you grew these seeds for us. And that leads to my next question. The last question, is there anything else you'd like people to know about seed production or the Texas plumes or you? And then how can people connect with you? I I really hope that after watching some of this, that there are people out there who realize that they can produce their own seed, that they can try and keep different types of biodiversity around that are, that are just, it's harder and harder to find. And I really hope that you go out and you try, you know, try these Texas plumes and try and cut them for some flowers, but try and save some of the seed because it's fun. It's just super fun. And before I tell you how to contact me, I, I want a big, just a big shout out to my husband, Casey, who is the main tractor driver and foreseer of everything on this farm. And also to my mom, who is our head soil blocking cedar and just my right hand lady in so many different ways. And I would be happy to answer any questions for anybody. We are on Facebook and Instagram as Fuggles Flowers. And if you have a more detailed question and you'd prefer email, it's fugglesflowers at gmail.com. And I'm just super excited that, you know, you can, you can start out as one thing, you know, I started out as a flower farmer here, I'm changing my direction. And, and it's so exciting to be able to be adaptable that way and to be able to, and I, again, another big shout out to Lisa for realizing that I needed to stay in the soil this year. So I love and, the gardener's and, workshop. You all <laughs> should love the gardener's workshop because it's, no, it's just, y'all are good people. You're amazing people. You're doing amazing things. Oh, thank you, Emily. And I knew that you were the right choice to entrust the seeds to, to be able to grow for us. And um, we're just really excited because everybody, everybody will have access to Texas plumes. Um, you know, it's all because of you. Well, it's because of all of us, you know, yeah. this, this is all a collaborative project. And that's what I love about flower farmers. We're all collaborative and home gardeners. We all have one thing in common. We love plants. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. yes. It's true. We definitely do. So thank you yeah. all. So <laughs> thank you so much, Emily, taking your time to kind of walk us through the process. I think it does help people to understand that growing for seed is has its own, it's its own can of worms, just like growing cut flowers or growing vegetables or growing herbs. And, you know, it's just nice to have kind of like a little bird's eye view into to what happened, how you did it and that you did do it. Um, I know you um, did a bunch of research being the scientist that you are and, um, you know, and it was a success and you don't know until you jump is the moral to this story. And thanks, Lane, for putting together that great slideshow with the questions and the pictures that um, Emily sent to us of the harvesting stages. And um, so I just think it's pretty exciting that Texas plumes are now coming into the mainstream. Yep. Awesome. And now anybody who buys them will know exactly where that seed came from, right? Where from they were Emily. born and raised. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Thanks. thank you so, so much for being here, Emily. That was really amazing information, a great look at behind the scenes process and an instructional guide for anyone that's interested in trying to save their own seed. Go back and listen to this and try some of the things Emily did and recommends. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us as well. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like or comment on YouTube and give us a rating or review in your favorite podcast app if you're listening. All right, friends, until we meet again, thank you, Lane and Emily. Bye, girls. Bye. Bye.